I don't know, instead of these, some of these wonderful looks ahead that you've done, I'm going to do a little bit of a look back uh, and, and a little bit different way than I think David's going to, to talk about uh, our actual experience of gastric cancer here over the last 30 years. Uh, it's a real privilege to present this, and uh, Yelena, thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, 30, uh, in 1985, uh, we, uh, they found the Titanic. Uh, the first mobile phone was used. Ronald Reagan was the president. Windows 1 was released. A Ford Mustang, I'm kind of a car guy, cost $7,000, unthinkable amount at that time. Live Aid concerts raised $284 million for Africa back when people were doing the right thing for the right reasons. Uh, the Dow Jones closed that year at 1,546. As of this morning, uh, it was 25,583. I think it's a little bit lower now than it was this morning, but that's that's your up-to-date stock quote. Uh, and in 1985, the U.S. national debt was $1.9 trillion, sort of a fraction of what Intuitive Surgical uh, 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 had. It was 46% of the annual GDP. As of this morning, it was $21.6 trillion, or just over 100% of our U.S. GDP. Um, also in 1985, a young guy came out of fellowship as uh, Murray Brennan's first hire to the staff of uh, Sloan Kettering. He got a lot better uh, after that first hire. And you can see the first challenge here was that he was trying to get in through the door uh, the, the wrong way. Murray, I, again, you could have done, uh, you, 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 you've learned from your experience. What I'd like to do, because also in 1985, uh, Murray started a prospective database of all patients with gastric cancer admitted to Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And I'm going to talk about 30 years. I'm not going to talk about the last three years. I'm going to talk about 30 years. This particular database includes all of the CWIRT 2-3 GE Junction cancers, and I'll segregate them out when I think there's a message. Um, uh, there was great foresight here, because in addition to demographics workup treatment, he looked at, uh, he, uh, Murray insisted on disease-specific outcomes. So this is not an administrative uh, database with just vital status, but this is the influence of cancer on, on your life. And that's expensive data, but I think very important. Now, the other thing that highlights this database is that every month we meet, and there's a physician-level review, both pathology and, and surgical, as to the quality of the data that goes in the database. So this is not... Um, th this is very high-level data. This is research-grade data, uh, as opposed to most databases. And I, I think we do owe a real debt of gratitude to Murray for his, uh, for his foresight here, but also, in particular, Marianne Beninati, who carefully curated this database for over 30 years with enormous dedication and consistency. Um, as you all know, this is a team sport. Uh, these are just as a fraction of the other members of the team. Uh, from every discipline across the hospital, uh, without whom this, uh, this would not have been possible. Well, what have we seen over the last 30 years? You've heard some of it. We've got improved diagnostic and staging technology. Uh, we've seen multiple prospective randomized clinical trials, particularly in the last 20 years, uh, describing lymph node biology, multimodality therapy, and surgical approaches, which uh, Raja just talked about. Um, I'm going to touch on a few of these because it's very hard to summarize 30 years in 15 minutes. The first thing I think we've learned, and everybody in the room knows it, is that gastric cancer is not one disease. I don't even think it's four diseases. I think it's a, a thousand diseases. Uh, but we're beginning to understand the biologic complexity and heterogeneity of it. I was particularly interested in your comments earlier about the signet ring cell, non-signet ring cell, and diffuse, non-diffuse, something that we often used synonymously, and yet clearly something in your trial was able, able to distinguish the difference. So uh, let's go to the database. Uh, over this, this first 30 years, 30 years, we had over 5,000 admissions to the hospital with gastric or GE junction CWIRT 2-3, the vast majority of whom underwent at least one operation, 4,500. Of those 4,500, uh, about 3,500 had some sort of resection. Uh, the other uh, 1,000 did not. Those were mostly diagnostic laparoscopies or uh, palliative procedures. 
And of the 3,400 patients, we have about almost 3,000 curative gastrectomies. So I'm going to focus a lot on the curative gastrectomies uh, as we go through this. Um, the reason I'm going to is because they comprise a very different population uh, than the palliative or uh, uh, the palliative or R R1 resections. These are the group that uh, we hope to influence. When we looked at this, uh, at this cohort with a multivariable analysis, the, uh, the factors that emerged as independent predictors included female gender. Um, BMI, which I'm going to come back to, did not uh, achieve statistical significance. Uh, age did not achieve statistical significance for disease-specific survival. Uh, site, as you've seen earlier, did, and I'll show that again. Uh, and Loren type, uh, the diffuse intestinal, uh, 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 was highly significant. Obviously, T and N stage are important, and LVI, as you all know, is a, is a predictor. If you look at gender, uh, women have about a 10% ad, uh, uh, advantage. And again, these are adjusted uh, survival curves. Um, you see the, exactly the same thing we saw earlier, that Antrim does much better, and that as you migrate more proximally here to the GE junction, uh, there's a worse prognosis, uh, the GE junction being just about as bad as this diffuse linitis plastica. Uh, we're only beginning to understand that biology of tumors, which uh, particularly the intestinal type, look pretty much the same under the microscope. Um, this uh, diffuse intestinal, uh, uh, it, it, this just highlights this biologic variability. Uh, these patients very nicely segregate into, t by T stage, by N stage, by AJCC stage grouping. And I'll just again highlight that these are R0 resections with stage 4 disease. In the AJCC7 system, they, they did not all have metastatic disease. Lymphovascular invasion is a very powerful uh, thing. And I think Bruce Minsky made this observation in colon cancer. Uh, it, the, and this is independent of nodal status. Um, what about this? Because we're seeing more and more of this, and now I want to talk a little bit about trends. Uh, and this has a little bit, to, this has something to do with Raj's uh, 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 comments about surgical technique. There's no question about the fact that as surgeons, which this affects us more than it affects the medical oncologists, patients are getting heavier and heavier. Uh, we have uh, uh, now only a third of patients whose BMI is under 25, uh, and the, and, uh, I don't know, Raja, you may have to send me a copy of your special consent form because I think we're, we, we may need it. Um, we are using diagnostic tests more frequently. As you can see, over the three decades, a, 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 a dramatic increase in the use of PET scan among the R0 patients, particularly so in the GE junction patients. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound, uh, something that was really pioneered here by Charlie Lightdale and Jose Botet uh, many years ago is also on the rise for all R0 patients, particularly the GE junction, where it is a primary driver of clinical staging and subsequent treatment. Pretreatment laparoscopy, which I also think was largely birthed here by Kevin Conlon uh, many years ago, uh, is now almost mandatory in patients undergoing R0 resection for all patients, uh, much less so in GE junction cancer, and I think that's appropriate. It's the CWIRT3 patients who need to be staged. I think this is largely irrelevant for those patients that don't have an intra-abdominal component of their tumor. But with this increased use of diagnostic tests over the last 30 years, our, our zero resection rate is getting better. We are getting better at selecting patients. We're taking fewer patients to the operating room for non-therapeutic intervention. Um, I, uh, th this this uh, graph here speaks to surgical approach. When I came in 1985, we didn't know which end of the laparoscope to put inside a patient. And even uh, as, as much as, as 10 years ago, we were doing very few uh, laparoscopic or minimally invasive uh, uh, operations. Um, you can see up to 2015, the, the introduction of robotics, the gray curve, and the increasing use of laparoscopic uh, uh, resections. This is almost exclusively uh, uh, due to Vivian Strong's expertise in the area. And if I were to show you the last three years, it would be dramatically increased. Um, lift node retrieval is an interesting um, endeavor. I think it represents a collaboration be uh, between the surgeon and the pathologist. 
We have been exceedingly fortunate throughout the entire 30 years to have dedicated pathologists who, are, who collaborate with us to adequately stage our patients. Uh, you, you've all heard about this, uh, this sort of revolution over the last 18 years in positive prospective randomized clinical trials of pre-, peri-, or post-operative adjuvant therapy. And this, is, this has not gone on, gone on recognized, and that you see the yellow bar, which is the patients who had surgery only, continually shrinking. Uh, so this is now a, an, a completely accepted fact of life in which two-thirds of our patients receive some treatment, uh, some multimodal treatment uh, uh, over and above surgery alone. But if you look, and this is, a, this is a real challenge for us, is the clinical risk estimate before pathology. If you take patients in whom we've clinically staged as T34NNE or TNEN positive, uh, now 90% of our patients are undergoing some form of pre-, peri-, or post-operative treatment. So uh, I, I believe, and I believe this is correct based on the fact that there's a, a remarkable concordance in the prospective randomized trials uh, that suggest that this is making a difference. I want you to remember that statement that I just made at the end because it's important. I believe in neoadjuvant therapy. Or I believe in perioperative treatment. In fact, I believe in post-op treatment. I think it, it improves the disease-specific survival of patients who present with gastric cancer. Um, with the increased use of, of adjuvant therapy, not all of which, about half of which is preoperative and the, other about, uh, the, the rest of which is post-op only, what you're seeing here is a dr fairly dramatic increase in the stage 0 and stage 1 patients. Stage 2 is about the same. The stage 3 is shrinking. Now, that's, that's important. That could be one of two things. That could obviously be pathologic downstaging, and that's why I've included YP staging in this group, or it could be earlier diagnosis. I happen to believe it's a combination of the both. I don't think it's a, 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 a exclusively attributed to uh, one or the other. Uh, the other thing we've done is the, uh, we've woken up to the concept that we are never going to have an effective program unless we have a, an, a clinically annotated biobank, and we're, we're getting much more enthusiastic. I think Elaine has been a huge part of that. In terms of uh, in terms of uh, providing us access, uh, next to last, um, we are actually getting a little bit better at doing this. Uh, the median length of stay when I arrived 35 years ago was uh, uh, two weeks. We're now down to about a week. Um, the 30-day uh, mortality, I think we've forget for this entire uh, database, is down to one percent. The 60-day mort mortality is down to two percent. So I think we have actually made a little progress, uh, whether that's uh, high volume, whether that's safer anesthesia. I happen to attribute most of it to our extraordinary surgical fellows who uh, can rescue almost any complication. Um, but we're, the operation is safer. So even though we're doing these D2 lymph node dissections, we are doing them safely, not at the, uh, at the mortalities observed in some of the prospective randomized trials. Now, this, these last three or four slides get to the meat of the issue. Um, how are we doing over the last 30 years? Well, if you took a look at this slide, I just closed it here, you would say, good for us, right? Uh, we have, this is our last 10 years, our middle, our middle 10 years, and our first 10 years. And it would appear at first, like, well, we can pat ourselves on the back, all go home, and, and, uh, uh, and that's that. Not quite that simple because if you look at stage specific survival, uh, and this is P or YP, so this is this doesn't reflect the impact of, on survival of anything that happened before the first postoperative visit. This is at the first postoperative visit. We have your pathology, whether or not you got therapy. Your prognosis is pretty much the same uh, as it was uh, 10, 10 or 20 years ago. Stage two, exactly the same. Um, Yelena, David, this is your problem here, okay? This is after treatment. However you get there to that, we've still, we're still losing 40% 40, 40 of our stage two patients. Um, no matter how they got there, that's a problem. And it's the same for stage three, okay? This is a problem. We have not actually made 
the kind of, we've made progress with downstaging. I believe that's true. I think we have improved the survival of somewhere between 10 and now maybe with FLOT4, 20% of patients. But when you come to the office and you have stage 3 disease, you have a near 80% chance of dying of disease. This is disease-specific survival uh, by 10 years. That's a problem. That, that's a challenge. And I think a lot of the theme of this meeting, uh, to tell you the truth, is what are we going to do to budge that needle? We, we have really maxed out our surgical, in, in, uh, our surgical impact, I think, for the most part, with some tweaks. We are, we're starting to asymptote on chemotherapy, on radiation therapy, but we need, something, we need a new uh, strategy for this. And if you look at, in the multivariable analysis, the impact of era of treatment on on the, uh, uh, it did, there's absolutely no, we haven't budged the needle in 30 years. I think that's a very sobering uh, conclusion, at least to my 30 years here, is that, uh, that oh. so uh, Blake Cady, who is uh, as you, about as close to family to me as uh, anyone I know, uh, uh, this is the, one of the more quoted, uh, <laughs> one, one more heavily referenced of his quotes, biology is king. Selection is queen, and technical details of the surgical procedures, as Raj has told you, are the princes and princesses of the realm who frequently try to overthrow the powerful forces of the king and queen, usually to no long-term avail, although sometimes with uh, temporary apparent. Look at the, look at the uh, this is a 20-year-old quote. This is 21 years old, okay? It stands the test of time pretty well. If you pick your patients carefully, uh, that's probably the most important thing we can do because we're not affecting biology. And these technical details, we're, we're, we're uh, helping a little bit. Over the last three decades uh, of gastric cancer here at Sloan Kettering, we've noted a stable age gender distribution with a steadily rising BMI. We've had a generally stable primary tumor site distribution. I didn't show you all these slides with slightly fewer diffuse histology tumors. We're using uh, diagnostic tools for better selection with increasing frequency. Uh, there's clearly much more use of multimodality therapy. I think this is entirely appropriate, particularly in patients with advanced stage disease. There is an increasing uh, trend towards the use of minimally invasive resection, a subtle increase in the adequate lymph node yield, lower length of post-op stay, improved perioperative mortality, at early YP, T, uh, at P, T and N stage and earlier stage grouping. Independent factors predicting improved survival over the last 30 years in this entire cohort, female gender, uh, more distal tumors, intestinal histology, the absence of LVI and then lower, lower uh, stage, but there's been no meaningful improvement in stage specific, that's pathologic or YP stage specific, disease survival in the last 30 years. That's a challenge. Uh, so the pace of technologic and technological technical advances uh, uh, continues to accelerate, uh, but the impact of these advances I would, I would submit to you uh, on our patients' lives is measured in days with the expectation that we're approaching a point of diminishing returns in the very near future. So rather than focusing on how to remove more and more lymph nodes through smaller and smaller incisions, with increasingly expensive technology, all to achieve the same cancer-specific results. The future of gastric cancer really requires that we invest our resources to, lear to learn how to effectively eradicate this clinically inapparent residual disease left behind after complete resi surgical resection with or without neoadjuvant therapy. The impact of that strategy will be measured not in days, but in years, and that's the challenge. Um, I'd like to thank you, Elena, very much for the opportunity to proselytize a little bit. You know, I love a podium and I love an audience, so thank you. Thank you.